U.S. President James Garfield is not the most memorable resident of the White House. However, Garfield should be remembered for some epigrammatic praise he offered his former teacher. He said that an ideal college is simply Mark Hopkins on one end of the log and a student on the other. And we think that Garfield's ideal college is a pretty close approximation to the ideal school. Garfield, you may know, studied under Hopkins at Williams College, where Hopkins served as tutor and then president for more than 50 years. 50 years? Now that's a committed teacher. Rob, you've got to be close to that, right? <laughs> as was come in the 19th century, American college presidents would teach a capstone course. It was on moral philosophy. It was there that Garfield discovered, under Hopkins, what it was, what it was to approach and understand a college or a school, that it was essentially not a building, but rather voluntary relationships, relationships that permitted wisdom to be passed from one generation to the next. What Garfield said of colleges seems true at Great Hearts in that families do choose us voluntarily. And fundamentally, as you've heard repeatedly today, it's about the personal relationships in every classroom. We are here to cultivate hearts and minds, as you've heard said already. While Hopkins taught for almost 50 years at Williams, Great Hearts has only been doing this for a dozen, so we're just getting started. But the same commitment to students can be found in every class, in every academy, staffed by men and women, like yourselves, whose love of ideas is surpassed only by their love of students. We, in fact, as Katie mentioned, are committed to hiring passionate, passionate people. And we will continue to do so because this is Great Heart's secret ingredient. Ah, yes, the secret ingredient, lovingly made through a simple process of a three-hour online application process, followed by a one-hour interview teaching demonstration that is grueling with a debrief, finished off, of course, by a process of grueling you through NFO, and of course, three more weeks of training, 650 degrees, allow that sauce to cool for 10 minutes before ingesting. Well, in any case, I do hope you're encouraged to know that we sought the best not only to put you in front of the classroom, but to put you among colleagues who are best in class. In fact, we are depending on your potential to become like Mark Hopkins to the next generation. And yes, in all seriousness, we know that you bring so much to the classroom already. As I look out and I've seen so many of you in the classroom or in person, we've had conversations, your unique soul that you bring in there the passion for the subject area, your own sense of wonder, are the things that make the subject areas come alive for students. Probes them to inquire more deeply, agitates them, inspires them to love these things more fully. And that's what we love about you. But you, in conversations, have noted yourselves that you are not satisfied with relying simply on what you bring to the classroom initially. You are lifelong learners. So we desire to support you as such, to provide that catalyst for an ever-increasing delight in and mastery of the subjects. And our commitment to fulfilling that potential is not some simply platonic pie-in-the-sky idea, but it has practical implications. One of which being, my work over the coming year will be increasingly focused on teacher development, whether it's providing more workshops, or whether it's working with network instructional coaches as you dive more deeply into conversations within your disciplines. A good portion of my work, as some of you heard earlier, is working on curriculum, scope, sequence, resources that we want to provide for you. But we're also partnering with select institutions of higher education. Just this summer, we launched a one-of-a-kind graduate program in classical education at the University of Dallas. Fifteen of our teachers who are here today do I see a hand? Maybe? Somewhere? A few hands? There they are. Those 15 began their study of the history of liberal arts education and are now returning to their respective academies with a deeper appreciation of how Great Hearts is making a contribution to classical schools and the revolution of classical education. Now he's being hyperbolic. <laughs>
But let me give you another example. For the first time this July, we provided all new teachers, not just K-5 homeroom teachers, with a full 10-day program of workshops beyond new faculty orientation to get ready for day one in the classroom. It was such a beautiful start to a teacher's lifelong conversation around best practices. And we are hopeful that this is the start of a two-year full program of study for all of our new teachers to establish the foundation of your success at Great Hearts. And we hope that the conversations will continue through your headmasters, through master teachers. And again, in turn then, we hope to provide more resources, more coaching conversations, more workshops to master teachers as you strive to become better teachers of teachers. This next year, we're gonna show you those master teachers and other scholars at play in the fields that you've chosen connecting teachers to programs and professors from our neighboring universities. As example, James Tanton, mathematician in residence at the Mathematical Association of America, will be back again working with our math instructors to deepen their understanding and to develop their skill in the classroom. At the end of October, you should know, we will gather a select group of teachers and leaders to attend a symposium for grades seven to 12 writing Within the tradition of classical rhetoric, we are working to increase our understanding of the classical model. And we are informed as we long to find the best and brightest scholars in the country to join us. And finally, the other thing that we do is simply seek to provide more opportunities for you to be sitting in rooms with each other talking about these best practices. Possibly even foraying into using technology for one of the few ways in which it really does help teachers, which is to connect you and form a richer network of teaching resources, from videos of great teaching examples to just video conferencing with small groups around the network. Really hoping to utilize the collective growing wisdom in this room. We are committed to supporting your leaders. Those headmasters serve the faculty by encouraging their development as liberal artists. They provide a vision of classical education. It is intended to inspire, to inspire that esprit de corps of teaching from a tradition. Just like Hopkins led the faculty at Williams College, headmasters serve to exemplify the intellectual and moral life within a community of like-minded people. This year, you're going to see your headmasters in the classroom throughout the year. This is because they are committed to coaching you in your pursuit of excellence. And again, to speak practically, you've already heard the ways in which uh, we've increased fundraising efforts in the October 1 gala. Um, all of these efforts, I think, reinforce and show me a commitment that we really are here for teachers, that we are designing programs with an eye toward one end that we will help you move closer uh, to excellence because we know that you love the kids. And again, looking out, I, we love all of you. We know that you are extraordinary craftsmen, that you are the shaper of souls, and we just want to pour into that. So again, make no mistake, as Ward has said, great teaching is at the heart of our work. And by the way, we know that those who teach our students and work with them are not just classroom teachers. It is important that we give the shout out to everyone who provides support, from our exceptional student service coordinators who support you and the students in the classroom, our college counselors who offer guidance to our students through high school and making that transition into college. We're committed uh, throughout with health staff, with front office, with f and leaders. Everyone is there pulling at the oars in the same direction to serve our students. We're so excited to work with you in the coming days with more opportunities and more support coming to your academy. Let me say this, at the end of the day, what we really strive to do is properly honor the work that you put in every single day. And again, help you fulfill your potential so that together we can form that next generation. So if I could just draw on Garfield's aphorism, we believe that if you're on one end of the classroom and the students are on the other, that every great art student has the opportunity to experience an ideal, an ideal school through the extraordinary efforts of you, their teachers. So thank you. I'd now like to call to the podium several more of our great hearted colleagues to share with me the perspective on our work together in cultivating the hearts and minds. You'll hear from one of our brilliant headmasters 
Heidi Bazelov, have your soul, soul stirred uh, by our good friends and teachers, Toyin and Beth. You'll hear from Marilyn Packey, uh, the leader of operations team, and of course, one of our superstar office managers uh, from Maryvale Prep. So, Heidi. Do I need to sit? Oh, I was going to use my teacher voice, but that might be a little intimidating. I had planned to share some elevated thoughts from classical literature, uh, but because I'm a scientist, I thought I'd go with what I know. So instead today, we are here to talk about how altruistic behaviors impact symbiotic relationships, creating mutualistic societies. Woo! Go science! Actually, uh, it was during a casual dinner conversation with a retired teacher when she posed the question, what makes Trivium different from other schools? And I thought about my conversation around the table the night before with my twins who were in middle school, and they kind of ran through their list of things that had happened at school, and my daughter said, Mom, did you hear what the teachers did? And I, I stopped and I said, well, before I could stop her and say, this is my moralistic diatribe, no, we do not support gossip at this table, my son chimed in and said, Mom, did you hear? Did I hear? They proceeded to tell me how they had supported a family in our community whose father, a young woman whose father had passed away, how they'd attended a funeral in the wakes, how cards had been given to her household and meals delivered to her table, how the teacher was wearing a pin that said, walking with Samantha, in Latin, the words from our Latin teacher, and the art from our beloved Mr. Vendish. You see it is our people who make us different and set us apart, who ignite that fire. Now we know that great schools are formed by great teachers. We know that that's the distinguishing factor that sets us apart. But here at Great Hearts, I would submit to you that it's something more. It's that heart of service. It's that intentional giving and serving of others that makes us unique. So what does servant leadership actually mean? It means doing those small, unremarkable things, right? It's setting up the table so someone else doesn't have to. It's serving during another long lunch period and extra duty because someone wasn't feeling very well. Or how about that extra tutoring session for that math student or one of my favorites, cleaning out a locker, helping a sixth grade student clean out a locker who had left every remnant of his paper sack lunch for a whole semester in the bottom of it. Yeah, it was lovely. Going, to, going after a long day to cheer on a middle school soccer team, dressing up as Mr. Tumnus and serving tea in fifth grade, coming in early to meet parents or staying late to meet parents to get forms. It is those remarkable moments, things like cupcakes for finals or dragging your barbecue grill in to be the musical theater group that define us because those seemingly unremarkable tasks are what make us remarkable. And I would submit to you, even though these all occurred at Trivium, every one of our schools has exactly the same story to tell. As servant leaders in classrooms, we are called to demonstrate civility and honesty fairness and self-control. As teachers, it is important that we inspire our students to serve as well, to ignite that flame. I'm inspired that this care doesn't just happen at the schools, because we see it every day. It happens at all levels of our organization. Whether you've been through the HR process and the talent review process, which we heard could be quite daunting, whether you've had the great pleasure to work with Ramsey during budget cycle, go budgets, or whether you've worked with your ESS teams out of across the network, it is the same they serve. I've had the distinct pleasure of working with our leadership team, and I will tell you at every single one of my meetings, they start or end with what can I do to help you. That is something remarkable. Now, I could have talked about the pillars, right? Or even the power of resurrecting a liberal arts education in modern society. But in the end, it is and always will be our people. So back to the question. Why 
Why is Great Hearts different? It's because we serve. And when we serve others, notice. My daughter ended the conversation with a good science reference. I'll just give you there. She said, Mom, the teachers sort of create this atmosphere. It's sort of like a contagion. I was like, contagion? Uh, and then she reflected, reflected back and thought better to say, uh, no, it's sort of expected. It's expected that we help each other. Because you see, we listen and we learn and we watch and we repeat. So, in other words, you've passed on the flames. So thank you for creating the fabulous conversations around our table at night, for creating conversations that matter, for serving in those remarkable, seemingly small ways. And thank you for being a blessing to us all. Hearts teacher, but as you can see, I also love being a Great Hearts parent. And each day on the way to school, my four children and I will pray together to prepare us for the day. And in that prayer, I am consistently filled with gratitude that I get to do what, the work that I do. We as Great Hearts teachers have the amazing privilege of modeling for our students one of the traits that is distinctive to humanity living for things that have eternal value, truth, beauty, and goodness. I'm thrilled that I not only get to teach and model virtue, but that is what I seek each day. I'm investing my life into the souls that are entrusted into my classroom. Teaching, then, is not merely my job, but it's my mission. And that mission lends weight and value to the seemingly mundane tasks of any school day. Things like reminding that student to tie his shoes or tuck in his shirt again and again. Or adapting my lesson plan to accommodate a particular IEP. Or taking the time to listen to my colleague as she's working out her own classroom dilemma. Serving my students and my fellow teachers in those little moments then becomes momentous. As we study together the lives of the great leaders of Western culture, I can point them to humble leaders like Abraham Lincoln and Socrates. Um, I can point out to them characters from our fourth grade curriculum, like Heidi or George Washington, who gave up their own needs and wants in order to serve others. Um, we celebrate characters from literature, like Cap Garland and Almanza Wilder, who risked their lives to save their town. I'm showing my students that like these examples, their lives have value and purpose. And there is undeniable beauty in the role of serving others. The sweetness of this approach is that I also benefit. I receive great fulfillment in living out that noble calling. Serving my students looks so different than merely managing their behavior or covering, covering particular curricular objectives. In the millions of fleeting moments of interaction in which I serve the souls of my students, I know I'm imprinting upon their hearts an indelible image. That reality fills me, fills me with delight and trepidation every single day. One gift to me in that endeavor is that I am surrounded by an entire faculty of people who embody that. It is my great honor to live and work with you guys every day. There's no other place where I could bring my students alongside of me in my own pursuit of truth and beauty and goodness like I can teaching at a great heart school. I'll be honest, I really enjoy my summer break. <laughs> you with me? <laughs> but I'm also really looking forward to starting this year and living out this opportunity with you together. Hello, great hearts. Hello. My heart is filled with irrepressible joy as I stand before you all this evening. My name is Toyin Atalagbe, 
I serve as the Dean of Academics at my new family, Archway Lincoln now. I was born in Lagos, Nigeria, and that is where I spent the first 24 years of my life. My father was a diplomat, and my mom was an elementary school teacher. I would classify my family as a middle class family. But it was still very difficult for my parents to pay my tuition at the private primary school that offered the classical liberal arts education. This notwithstanding, they sacrificed virtually everything. And when I say everything, I mean everything. To enable me to attend that particular private school, I am eternally grateful to them for the choices they made regarding my education because it gave me the foundation I needed to be successful. Apart from attending the right school, my parents instilled in me a lifelong passion for the pursuit of excellence by helping me to form the right habits. They created an environment with structure that enabled me to do and be so much. Uppermost in their minds was the help, uppermost, uppermost in their minds was to help their six children live a morally upright life. Today, I will share with you some of my favorite quotes from life's lessons that my parents instilled in me. My dad, he would say, a good name is better than silver or gold. Protect your integrity, child, by doing the right thing all the time. <laughs> <laughs> My mom would say, keep your head up high, look up, smile all the time. That's how you make friends. My dad, in his very deep husky voice, would say, Come on, child. In life, challenges will come. But be brave. I do not know of any storm that lasted forever. My dad again, he would tell me, never go weary. When someone calls, you should answer, regardless of how many times they call you. Answer, child. <laughs> and this was one of my favorite. When my parents would ask us a question, and this is my mom now, even before she gives you an opportunity to respond, she will say, when you tell the truth, you put the devil to shame. And my dad will end by saying, and give the angels an opportunity to rejoice too. <laughs> These were the life lessons that shaped my upbringing. And so when I came to work for Great Hearts six years ago, my personal values aligned well with Great Hearts organizational values. And so even now that I have two kids, I try to bring them up the way I was brought up by inculcating in them these values that my parents inculcated in me. But guess what? You all know how hard it is to raise children in this generation. So for that, I must give a shout out to all our wonderful teachers that teach our students every day. Teach them intellectual and moral virtue. My six-year-old came home one day and she said, you know what, mom, in school today, Miss Saif said that I should not only be a good citizen of my school and of my country, I have to be a good citizen of my home. So I have decided to start washing the dishes. <laughs> I said to myself, long live great hearts. <laughs> the constant reminders from my parents helped shape my personal values. What I have realized over the years is that 
Regardless of your geographical location or your cultural background, there is truth, beauty, and goodness in teaching virtues, both intellectual and moral virtues. Our primary purpose as educators is to continue to create an environment where we can nurture a love of moral and intellectual virtue. Plato attests to this notion when he said the goal of education then is to create the right environment. And I know that at Great Hearts, this is the environment that we create for our children. This is what makes us different from the school down the road. That environment we create every day where teachers are serving and modeling virtues every day. I know that in creating this environment, there are voices behind the curtains telling you it's not possible. Do not, and I repeat, dear colleagues, do not be drawn into the mentality of impossibilities. Instead, tell those voices of gloom that they should relax. It is possible. Schools like Great Hearts, we are doing something about raising the next generation right from the scratch. And when I say right from the scratch, I mean in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, all the way up to 12th grade. How many of you agree with me? The vision that I see for Great Hearts 15, 20 years from now is that vision where you look at the Senate, you look at the House of Rep, you look at the presidency, and there will be alumnus of Great Park School. Thank you. Thank you for agreeing with me. Our students will find the cure for cancer. I feel strongly in my mind. They will take a trip to anywhere in space that exists that no one has ever been to. What I must remind you of, those voices, those pessimists will sit down and say that they are a hopeless generation. Patrick Henry said, hope becomes an illusion when we do not act. They are not a hopeless generation. Tell them that we are building an environment that is indescribably positive, nurturing and empowering for our future leaders. Tell them we are life changers, raising a whole new generation of leaders that are historically informed, language proficient, ideologically sound, and virtue driven. Lastly, tell them to stop worrying Tell them to stop being pessimists. Tell them to join the revolution. It doesn't matter as what? A nurse, ESS specialist, an assistant teacher, a board of director, a headmaster, a teacher, a parent. Just tell them to join the revolution. Thank you. next. <laughs> I, I have written on this page that I'm always so impressed uh, when I have the pleasure to hear some of our faculty talk about why they are here and a part of our Great Hearts community. If that hasn't inspired you today, I don't know what's going to, and I doubt it will be me. So uh, I, I'm, I'm almost speechless, but I know I can't be. Um, I too started out my career in the classroom. And I loved my time in the classroom. However, I realized that I wanted to do and have more of an impact in more than just my classroom. I wanted to have an impact in all our classrooms. So I quickly transitioned my career into a supporting role, working with process and systems and tools to assist teachers and administrators to make their job easier. 
You see, I wanted to make someone else's job a, a little easier, a little less hectic, and a lot more fun. I wanted to be that person behind the scenes who created those efficiencies for others. And at the time, I didn't really think of it as servant leadership. To be honest, I probably really didn't even know about servant leadership then. But as my career progressed, I started to learn about it. And what I realized was, this was a part of who I am. It is what I try to model every day. When I had the opportunity to come to Great Hearts, I was so excited to be part of an educational system that provided a world-class education to all children. Not just children who could afford it, but to all children. I was so excited to come work with a team of dedicated professionals that were focused on providing enriching experiences to our children and serving each other to become the most highly effective charter school network in the country. This is my dream job. As Great Arts continues to grow, we will continue to refine our programs and our systems and the support of all of you. This year I am so excited to be able to work with Robert Wagner and his team to put our systems and our processes to focus on the work that you all do so that you can all focus on the most important job in this company, teaching our students. But there's another group that I was really excited and I feel very privileged to work with and that's our office management team. You know that your office manager is that person that juggles every item and keeps you and everybody else in the school going down the right road all year long. They're the traffic engineers. The folks that we ask all our questions to when we don't know where to go. They're the folks that help you find things around the school. Uh, where's that copy paper? What's my email address? When's that faculty meeting? They're the ones that are always there to pitch in and help to make your day and your students' day a little bit easier. You know them. They make the copies. They answer the phones. They talk to parents daily. They answer millions of questions. They type the newsletters. They print the calendar. Well, you, you get my point, right? These are the folks that jump in to support in any way they can to ensure you and your students have that great day. They continually lead with a servant's heart. I'm pleased and honored today to introduce to you one of our stellar office management team members who will share with you why they're a part of our Great Hearts community and why servant leadership is a part of their daily life. Jacqueline Soto, Jackie, is the office manager for the Maryvale Prep Campus. Jackie's been the office manager there for the past four years. Through that time, Jackie has seen Maryville grow to 426 students this year. Awesome. And as you all know that with every student that joins our school, there are multiple family members that come along with them. That 426 number doubles really quickly. And at one point or another, during one day or many days, they will need Jackie's assistance. Jackie has been instrumental in helping not only her own families in the Maryville community, but families within the network, as she's helped us translate various policies and procedures from English to Spanish. She routinely answers the call of her fellow office managers who are asking for suggestions on, hey, do you know where I can get that book? What are you doing about uniforms? How about, how do you do with pickup after school? All those millions of questions that they deal with on a daily basis. Jackie is a symbol of servant leadership. I'm so proud and pleased to introduce to you Jackie Simba. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Marilyn. Um, as she said, you all have a superstar office manager in your school. So make sure you always thank them and appreciate them and love them. Uh, <laughs> um, I am very excited to announce that I actually will be serving 456 students at Maryville Prep this year. 
um, we, uh, I'm, with humility, I am very proud to say that, um, you know, that at Maryville Prep, we started out with 140 students back in 2012, and we now will be serving those 456 as of next week. Um, I came to Great Hearts after an extensive search for the best school where my only daughter could go to uh, school. She was starting kindergarten back then. And when I learned about Great Hearts Academy, um, I knew I was going to the right place. The, the problem was that there weren't any campuses where I lived. Um, I then proceeded to call the lead office and I talked to somebody that said, actually, we are building a school and Maryville Prep is coming soon. I knew from that moment on that I was getting called to serve not just my own family, but more who were looking to find that place where their children could grow, not just as academically, but in the pursuit of truth, goodness, and beauty. I was asked today to give you a speech um, operating in my role as an office manager um, with a servant's heart and what that means to me. It was a great honor to receive such notice uh, because I normally get asked to create reports, unjam the copy machine, um, <laughs> what is that vomit policy? Um, fellow office managers, you know that's a real question. <laughs> and an endless list of expected but also unexpected tasks. As an office manager at Maryville Prep, to me, operating with a servant's heart simply means I have many opportunities to serve others and be reminded of my leadership by running the school alongside my colleagues. Continuously ensuring our schools are operating in compliance with great heart standards, state standards, and more importantly, my community standards. Servant leadership is truly a balance between being a leader, but also a servant. Having the humility to serve others with dignity, taking into account my own dignity and the dignity of others. Being a part of the culture of trust and love that we all have at each of our schools. Letting yourself be led through conversations and community while contributing our own moral, intellectual, and physical virtue. As I stand here before you, I look forward to continuing to serve in all my capacity, all my heart and soul unconditionally, especially to those who have allowed me to serve over the last few years. All of my families, my 456 students as of August 10th, my headmaster, Mac Isa. Yeah. Robin, Lori, Amanda, Marilyn, and most importantly, all of you. Today, I want to leave you with this quote from Robert L. Stevenson and call you to serve on a daily basis. Don't judge each, each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds that you plant. It was exactly one week ago today that Dr. Dan Scoggin, one of the founders of Great Hearts, walks into my office with a big smile on his face and says, Jake, I need you to juggle at Summit. And I need you to say something profound. And you have five minutes to do it in. So I thought to myself, well, he wants me to juggle, which I've never actually done, ever. Uh, and he wants me to say something profound. And I don't know how much of that I've done either. And he wants me to do it in five minutes. And I know I've never said anything in five minutes. <laughs> but I said, I'm in. And that left me in a predicament. Because I thought, I thought long and hard about what I was going to say. And at first I thought, you know, what I'll do is I'll try to connect in a profound way the act of juggling to what goes on in our classrooms. I'll say something about, I don't know, a humane letters teacher, and I'll talk about all the great works that they're trying to balance and juggle up in the air, 
from Aristotle to Austin, from Dickens to Dostoevsky, and they have so much of this going on that eventually one of those great works just might fall. But then they look at that and say, well, that was the Communist Manifesto, so it's okay. <laughs> And then I decided there are probably some people who like that, and in fairness, it's part of our curriculum, but let's be honest, if one of them has to go. And I decided I didn't want to offend people, so I won't make that joke. So then, then my next idea was a lot easier. I thought, I'm just going to connect juggling to life in general. I'll say something like, you know, life is like juggling. You gotta catch whatever comes your way. And you always gotta be prepared. And I had this great trick that I was gonna do. I was gonna juggle up and down the front row, and then for one unsuspecting victim, I was gonna toss it right at them. And when it gets within about two inches of their face, I was gonna grab it. And they'd jump back and they'd say, see, you have to be prepared. And then I remembered I tried that trick once. The key word being tried. And that will never ever happen again. And this is a good thing, because the front row is filled with a bunch of board members and executives. <laughs> but that left me in a quandary, because if I had nothing profound to say, then what was I going to do? And I decided just to be very, very practical. I'm going to go ahead, once and for all, and answer those two questions that are on your mind. Or rather, I should say, for most of you, it's one of two questions. You see, I've noticed that as people watch jugglers, they, they can't help themselves. They fall in one of two categories, and they absolutely have to have one of two questions answered. Now, the first personality is very precarious. It sees a juggler and all the pins flipping through the air, and they just simply can't hold back. They have to ask that question. Can you do chainsaws? <laughs> no, I cannot do chainsaws. I have no desire to do chainsaws. I like thinking in base 10. I don't want to have to think in base 5. <laughs> that's okay, because that's a math joke. It involves cutting your hand off. Someone else will explain it later. You <laughs> see, there's, there's another personality, though, that doesn't really think about chainsaws. But like a chainsaw thinker, they can't help themselves either. They see a juggler and the club's flying through the air, and they simply have to ask, are you a clown? I am not a clown. Juggling is serious business. It involves artistry and, and precision and, and truth, goodness and beauty. I'm not a clown. But it does raise a very interesting question as to what kinds of people find themselves interested in juggling. So it turns out, if you go to professional juggling competitions, otherwise known as gatherings of really cool people, kind of like a Great Hunt Summit, you will find that there are two subgroups of really, really cool people that are overrepresented. And of course, here I mean mathematicians and physicists. So this is true. And we don't know why there's this connection. What is it that links that mind that is inherently interested in math and, and physics to that mind that is interested in juggling? And psychologists have been studying this for millennia, trying to... So that's not true. <laughs> psychologists have not been studying this at all. They don't really care. But it is true that among the best jugglers in the world, you will find a disproportionate number of professional mathematicians and physicists. And I first realized this when I went to college. So I went to the great Denison University, and my advisor and math professor there was one of the world's best jugglers. This is a guy who could juggle eight bean, uh, nine beanbags at once. Just to put that in perspective, the world record is 10. There are only a handful of people in the world that can juggle nine. But more importantly, he introduced me to an area of mathematics that was aptly called the mathematics of juggling. Now, just to be clear, we are not talking about the physics of juggling. We're not talking about parabolic paths. We're not talking about following trajectories or the, the physics of a spinning club. We're talking about the mathematics. We're talking about taking juggling patterns and coding them with sequences of numbers and using advanced number theory and modular arithmetic to figure out which ones are possible. And so the mathematicians would do all this stuff and figure out these new juggling patterns. And of course they were jugglers and they would hand those patterns over to the jugglers who themselves were mathematicians and the jugglers would sit there and try to figure out what they look like and how hard they are. And at that moment I knew I was hooked. Because let's be honest, what other discipline can you study something so utterly useless? <laughs> of course, 
That's not really what I mean. I mean, in what other discipline can you study something so utterly non-utilitarian? I went off to graduate school, and I studied much more serious mathematics. But I simply couldn't help myself. At the end of it all, my master's thesis was in fact on the mathematics of juggling. But at this point, I find myself in a bit of a precarious position. Because I've likely gone beyond my five minutes. I don't think I've said anything profound. I did juggle, so I guess I met one of the three objectives of Dr. Scoggin, and I will expect my written evaluation later. But it also leaves me in a quandary as to how I'm going to end this. Because in just a moment, Mr. Ellison is going to take the stage and he's going to give you the charge for the year. And I guarantee you he will have something profound and eloquent to say, in only, only as Mr. Ellison can do. For my own part, it just seems to be a much simpler message. I can only offer you a bit of advice. I don't know if it's profound, I don't think it has anything to do with juggling, but I know that it's true. I know that it's important. If you remember one thing, it's always to remember to have fun. This, this is noble work that we do, but it is hard work, and there are days where it's really hard, and you feel like you're just juggling kids. And if you're a kindergarten teacher, that's okay, because they're small and light. For others, it's not okay. But even on those difficult days, we have fun because we enjoy what we do, because we love what we do, and we take that joy and we communicate it to our students. So the only thing that I can leave you with is the very best of wishes, that you have the best year of your career, and above all, that you have more fun this year than you have ever had in your entire life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jake. That was uh, spectacular. Jake was actually filling in. Uh, we were supposed to have Susan Wise Bauer here on a unicycle, but she canceled the last minute. So, thank you. Um, just uh, one reminder before we wrap up here, uh, after we close, on the other side of the Great Divide, the Black Curtain, we will have a happy hour. Uh, there will be live music. There will be gratis appetizers. Uh, there will be ale and old sack for all who, uh, who care to drink in the Shakespearean vein, beer and wine uh, for, for the rest of us. Uh, so please stay with us until 6 o'clock p.m. Help shut the place down uh, at our, our post-summit happy hour. Uh, some words of thanks as well. Uh, we want to thank, uh, first and foremost, uh, Gerald and, and the talent team for putting the summit together. All of my colleagues, uh, from the classroom to the offices, uh, to the board, uh, to the executive team, uh, for, for the, their wonderful words. Uh, it is very humbling to speak at the end of this after all these remarkable men and women uh, have shared their stories and their perspectives. We want to thank our friends at Grand Canyon University uh, for loaning us their, their living room and letting us uh, have this event here. We look forward to coming back sometime soon. The gratis appetizers I mentioned earlier are courtesy uh, of one of our vendors, uh, Dishes to You, uh, who uh, does catering for some of our school lunch programs. Thank you very much, Dishes to You, for the free food. So, for a closing, it seems to me appropriate to turn to the close of a great teacher's career. I'm thinking, of course, of Socrates of Athens. The end of his public career is presented in the dialogue of Plato, the Apology, which is anything but Socrates saying he was sorry for all that business. Now, those of you who read the Apology or heard of it, you may be accustomed to thinking of this as the defense speech of Socrates at his, at his criminal trial, uh, the, the dialogue in which we hear about his, uh, the accusations against him, his conviction, and his sentencing. This, of course, is somewhat of a downer, very arousing or inspiring. So, 
Try to reimagine the apology, if you will. Think with me. Reconceive it as Socrates' retirement party. I think the analogy works. We've got tribute speeches from a lot of folks who knew his life and work very well. Uh, we have a farewell speech by a curmudgeonly 70-year-old uh, who is leaving the public classroom for the last time. We have the customary accusations of blasphemy against the gods, of corruption of the youth. So it's kind of a retirement roast. Why don't we think of it in those, in those terms? The Apology uh, is a very, very important and fundamental text. Rather than being a defensive account of Socrates' life and work, it is a positive, powerful portrayal of the vocation to teach by self-examining, by challenging oneself. Reread the Apology this year, if you've read it already. Read it for the first time if you haven't. Read it with friends. Read it with colleagues. Read it with just one other person. Read it once a year for the rest of your life. It's very short. It's doable. This wonderful dialogue is the source of what you probably already know as Socrates' most memorable statement, the unexamined life is not worth living. This text is also the place where Socrates famously formulates his claim that his wisdom consists only in knowing that he does not know. He tells a wonderful story of how he came to possess this wisdom. But beyond these memorable aphorisms, there are two particular ideas or sayings of Socrates in the Apology that I think are particularly relevant to our work as teachers as we begin a new year in his footsteps as teachers of the young. The first is this. Faced with the charge that his entire career in life had been dedicated to blaspheming against the gods of Athens and to inventing and teaching some crazy heretical new religion of his own making, Socrates presents his vocation as a teacher in precisely the opposite light. He is accused of seeking to tear down everything that is good and holy. Oh no, he answers, not at all. My love of wisdom and examination of self and others, my pursuit of truth and goodness, is an act of reverence, of service, of piety towards the gods, he says. An act of fidelity to that god Apollo, who, speaking through an oracle prophet, had once said that Socrates was the wisest of men. Socrates presents the work of the teacher as not being about tearing things down, not about making things up. It's a work of reverence, piety, devotion, service to the city, but to something even higher than the city, something above the city, to truth, goodness, and beauty, and to some form higher than and source of those as well. My friends, this, I submit, is the essence of the vocation of the teacher. Service to things divine. Serving souls, truly eternal and divine souls. Serving the community and the nation, Athens or Arizona. But it is noble to serve the community because teaching is something even higher than that. Socrates' contemporaries, the ancient Persians, the proverbial arch enemies of the Greeks, had at the center of their culture religious devotion to a sacred fire in their capital city, one which that thug and barbarian Alexander the Great extinguished. The tending of this fire, an eternal flame, was a task that had to be kept up day and night in war and peace, year after year, great king after great king. In the millennia before natural gas pipelines, this was no mean feat. Might we think of this tending? as an image of the work of a teacher. Nourishing, fueling the sacred fire, tending and stoking it day after day, devotedly, selflessly, and without ceasing. Secondly, and lastly, before his conviction and sentence in the Apology is delivered, Socrates boldly states he will neither seek nor accept acquittal on any conditions. He says he will never 
never, he can never, give up his self-examination and his pursuit of truth. If the jury were to offer him that, hey Socrates, quit out this whole questioning business and you can walk away a free man. Socrates answers with the following words, perhaps the most rousing, challenging, inspiring thing he has ever said. Socrates says to the jury, I would say to you, men of Athens, I am grateful and I am your friend, but I will obey the God rather than you. And as long as I draw breath and am able, I shall not cease to practice philosophy, to exhort you, and in my usual way, to point out to any one of you whom I happen to meet, good sir, you are an Athenian, a citizen of the greatest city, with a reputation for both wisdom and power. Are you not ashamed of your eagerness to possess as much wealth, reputation, and honors as possible, while you do not care for nor give thought to wisdom or truth or the best possible state of your soul. These words are like a cleansing, purifying fire. Do not your hearts burn within you as you hear this call to care for wisdom and truth and for the best possible state of your soul? Do you not burn to share this challenge with young people? We can only succeed in inspiring our students to do this if we challenge ourselves and challenge each other to do the same. I know that this fire is burning in you. I see it in your eyes and I feel it in this room. My friends, let us go and set hearts and minds ablaze.